Okay. Right. We're all good. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, have you ever been to Chicago before? First off, I have. I have in 2010. <laughs> oh my God. I'm dying to go back. Okay. Cool. We'll come back and visit and promote your movie here. But we're gonna do Ooh. our. Fun. I really yeah. want to go to some Chicago Film Festival, actually. So, um, fingers crossed, October. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, uh, just talk about the title of the movie to start off. Where did the title exactly come from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for me to find it, but the reason. Um, it's sort of, um, I think it was really like when I was writing it just as being 1999 and just like what you know, left me bewildered was like, wait, so 1999 is now a long time ago. Are you kidding me? You know, like, I feel like it was 20 minutes ago, but suddenly, no, I'm apparently writing a period film, you know? Um, and I felt like, you know, the, the time of it actually, like, shapes the story so much. And I wasn't going to be as obsessed with gadgets and things. I mean, yes, there's, like, you know, paper maps and, like, pay phones and things, because that was just present day based stuff. But to me, it was, like, the mindset of a particular time before... Uh, technology, digital technology became so pervasive. And I thought that was going to be one of the key things to shape the film. And also, obviously, it is about how you process things, like especially love and sex and relationships and connection at a particular age. And all the age of all of a particular time, that's now longer. Um, it's also a slightly pretentious way to phrase it, and it's about a boy who's trying to be extremely pretentious in the way he talks about art. So to say, my life is called of an age, that's a captured eternally. And then, of course, he's of an age at the start of the film, and he's of another age entirely <laughs> later on. Um, and the contrast between, you know, between that and what time does, um, you know, in different periods um, in history, uh, due to how they shape your life. Um, so it felt like the title was more of those things. Got it. Okay. Um, speaking of 1999, so Bic Runga, you used her song in it. And I went to a listening party with her in Chicago and I told her, oh, your song is cute. She did not like that. <laughs> She's not... So um, I wondered why you picked her song. Did that mean a lot to you? And... To me, I was like, um, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say cute. It's like very melancholy and actually like hits me deeply. The other thing is like, I mean, the growing up in New Zealand, not Australia, but like obviously these countries are very related. And my problem after I migrated to Australia is that like I didn't want to be there. Um, and that, that was not Australia's fault. It's entirely, you know, psychological when you're recruited at a particular age, speaking of age. Um, like I just, you know, had this sense of emotional dislocation. And I kind of resisted everything Australian and New Zealand by extension because I wasn't like, exposed to these kind of cultures and uh, art. Uh, from these places as much before in you know, 97. So the period between 97 and 2004 were just like the stories that I barely watched anything in Australia or, or from the general region I barely listened to anything and like actually appreciated it. Um, and you sway somehow cut through um, because it was in, in the radio a lot, especially in 98, 99. Um, and there was another song afterwards she made as well um, that also I found quite moving. But um, it could, despite my active resistance towards everything Australian and New Zealander, I, I, it was okay for me to say, no, this is a good song. Because normally I would just actively, consciously resist anything. Um, so the fact that I associated it with the time and the fact that I still found it moving, it could still be a bucket of, of that period, mm -hmm. um, as well as I think it's like, quite beautiful. Um, and it's also, I don't have much music from the yeah, from the actual region, um, because a lot of the stories about you know a boy who doesn't want to be there really, uh, at least for me on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we could have like this one piece, and then uh, was typically I was always trying to have one song repeat in a couple of places just because you know like day to day life isn't just this constantly collected chat track. This is a song you hear over and over again. Um, and I thought it'd be nice if you could sway because it can mean something else. Uh, the first time you hear it, and it means something else the second time. And it's just because it's this kind of like a you know, melancholy song. The first time it kicks into a T9 feeling, but the second time he's experiencing something really horrific. And I'm not sure how many people bring it is up, to be honest, but like, uh, I don't know. Like, this one really goes beyond microaggression when you're surrounded by people like really using critics slurs to belittle you and you're trying to like, you know, 
do it while they return, but it's not working. And the fact that there is this kind of song playing in the background that is a little bit consoling to me, uh, to kind of counterpoint the violence of the words. Um, that, that's what they're yeah, I can talk about that song a lot. Sorry, I just answer no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I was like, I learned never to tell an artist their work is cute because that's not ever good. Well, I, I feel like I would respond pretty much as she did. It was not work cute, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to us it's like life and death, you know, like what we could do. Yeah. I, uh, how did you do the aging between the the decades on? Uh, on the movie, how did that work? Because the, the actors were very different, and how was that process? Mm-hmm. Well, we did it for about uh, three days off plus the weekend, so that's five days to grow facial hair. <laughs> uh, we, we gave them haircuts, different clothes, and in terms of external interference, that was about all we could do. <laughs> and in, you know, in terms of the walls of time and physics, different <laughs> phase. Um, what it was, I think, um, and I think what a lot of people respond to is the, it's an internal psychological transformation. Um, and especially, I think, um, I mean, with both of them, I think with Tom Green, who plays the other character, it's a bit more subtle. And especially because, you know, between the age 23 and 34, you know, really changed. I mean, you're already a little bit more fully formed by 23, you know, so by 34, it's a similar vibe, but I still think she evolved in a way that I find quite believable it's just 34 is closer to uh my age mm-hmm. but um with elias who plays uh nicola who plays cole it was always gonna be a lot more of a challenge because in real life she was i think 23 at the time and it's um in fact when we saw a copy and didn't think it was like physically possible for someone to believably portray a 17 year old and 28 year old you know beyond just looking the part and whatever which itself is difficult but like you know so much happens and the, the, the issue is, you know, like playing someone younger than your age, fine, you understand where you're coming from and where you're going, but like playing someone with life experience beyond your actual years, and also, you know, someone who's lived in other countries and so on and so forth, like that was always going to be, I thought, impossible. And, but, you know, we just thought, like, well, let's just see what happens. And I, I spoke to Elias in detail about that and tried to kind of explain what, you know, how it felt differently for me just on the inside, like things like, if you go into a room when you're 28, you can kind of take in more of it uh, straight away, and you're a little bit, you know, your anxiety in a medical sense is maybe more prominent than it is when you're a teenager, but it's a different kind of thing. You take in more, so you're kind of calmer, you're less distractible, whereas when you're 70, everything's just distracting, and you're just like constantly like, well, easily overwhelmed. So it's like you're just playing someone who, who is, and especially in this case, it's a kid who goes from shy to confident, so those are one of the key differences. Mm-hmm. Um, but I spoke about this well before the shoot started. And we shot all of 1999 first, and then we got to 2010. There was no abstract, cerebral, intellectual conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at this point, he had lived with, you know, the character in his first for so long. And he was also growing as a person just up screen, you know, you could feel it. Like, there was, an, you know, the experience of, the experience we were always sharing was going changing us day to day. Like, it was a really, profoundly moving shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, we started shooting it. And at some point at the beginning, he was trying to play what I had fallen into. And then I realized, like, you know, for like five minutes, and I was like, you know, the bits that work are the ones where you're not doing what I'm telling you. Please ignore the fuck out of everything you've ever said. Like, there was something that he had absorbed so much. Like, and most of you know, we were spending a lot of time together. I'm much older than him. Like, but it was uncanny. It's like he had kind of absorbed so much of my personality as well that he was a believable grown man. Like, you know, it, I mean, let me assure you, every woman on set noticed it. <laughs> it, was, it was this sense of like, what just happened? And like, you know, there were times when I would just get teary watching him because I couldn't have like a parental relationship with all the kids as I called them, even though they were all adults, but the three main actors, you know, like, and it was just like, so moving for me to watch like all three of them, but especially Elliot and Heidi, who were so much younger, to just like you're seeing them grow in front of your eyes. And like they could be talking about like random bullshit and weather on the on that bus, but somehow just the way he's carrying himself, I'm like, you know, my boys grow up. <laughs> it's just like I'm having a pride, really. That yeah. like you know, like it's just beautiful to have known him, and especially in that period of his life. Yeah, did these were these actors out actors? Are they gay in real life? And was that important to you with casting? 
Uh, what was important to me in casting is that I believed that they're getting on screen. Um, and it was a very complicated process. There was a lot of, uh, I wasn't going to push for out because I think that um, career is associated with being quite well off, to be honest. Um, I think coming from a background I come from, and you know, I was I had a very different trajectory. So in my final year of high school, I was out and militantly queer, but I wasn't the only gay in the village. Um, and I, it stayed like that. Because there's a kind of reality, with, especially when you're going into other cultures and socioeconomics, where it is still quite dangerous physically, and obviously what that what that does to you know opportunity, or even people from a different socioeconomic background rarely actually get to enter the arts. Mm -hmm. I don't really think of the casting process where both gay and straight actors like I just couldn't get past the money in their eyes, and like I, not that I think you have to be the thing you're playing, but like. With younger actors, especially, I felt like if you don't have a certain kind of life experience, you can't really fake it. Um, so that's where I kind of went from. I wasn't going to push for out because I spoke to boys who clearly didn't want to be out and I wasn't going to punish them by not casting them for that mm -hmm. because they weren't rich enough, essentially. And circumstances didn't allow them, you know, to be. There at least two boys I spoke to who, um, they were, not even, I mean, I, they identified as straight, but like, you couldn't have, no, you know, like there's moments when you kind of know, and I just go, and it especially happened with like the ethnic boys, um, you know, his circumstances. Like there was another boy who pulled out of playing the younger brother because he found out there was a gay character, and it's like 2022 in Melbourne. Um, so to me, like I wasn't gonna punish anyone for not being out. Yeah, and, um, okay. The, that was kind of the approach it took. And I also don't want to talk too much about this because it can become quite invasive. But you know, I think my work both in the film I made before and the, this one and the filmmaking after, like there's a lot of queer people in it. Um, some of them we know about, some of them we don't, but I really, really feel uncomfortable about dwelling on it because it really fucks up people's lives. Right, got it. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. They're wrapping me up, but um, come to Chicago, visit us, and I uh, really enjoyed your film. Thanks so much. I'll be there in October, Jerry. Like, you just watch. There's no way. I missed out too many Chicago film festivals already here. Next one, I'm going to be there. Okay. All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Jerry. Bye. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Thanks.